All right, welcome to church tonight, Wednesday night. Glad you're here. And let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, then we'll stand and start to sing some songs. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight just so thankful to be in your house. I think that you said it will be called a house of prayer. And I pray that we would believe in you and have walk close enough to you to have assurance that our prayers are heard and answered. We do pray for Pastor and Miss Judy. I know they'll be mentioned later, but is there, uh, you'd bless them in where they are right now and with health and strength and your grace. I pray you'd meet with us tonight and speak to us through your word, encourage us through the hymns for your glory. In Jesus' name I ask these things, amen. amen. Let's go ahead and stand and take your, oh, uh, it's not a hymn no anymore. <laughs> Let, I am resolved. a couple announcements and uh, then we'll move into some prayer time. As you know, Pastor and Miss Judy are in Colorado and the uh, pastor will be preaching at um, uh, Calvary Baptist Temple tonight, so we'll be praying for him certainly. And then also for their, the remainder of their time, they're coming back on Friday. Uh, their schedule's kind of packed from a um, personal perspective, meaning they have a lot to accomplish, a lot of people to talk to, meet with, and um, the, the Chirp was prompted by his the brother's uh, death and home going. And so there are just a lot of things they, they're trying to work out and, and figure out right now. So please be in prayer for them each day. Then meanwhile, they've been keeping me updated on the Glebs. Um, brother Gleb has passed his COVID-19 issues, but now his body is not doing so well. And apparently, i um, probably mispronounce this, but uh, Guillain-Barre, uh, some sort of ailment that's a uh, creating a lot of conflict in his body and, and how to respond to different things. And so they transferred him to Denver, uh, to another hospital, and are dealing with that there. They feel that is treatable, so that's where he's at now. And then, meanwhile, Mrs. Gleb's sister just went into emergency surgery for diverticulitis. Um, and so 
that family's under some trials right now and some testing for, for sure, so please keep the gloves uh, in your prayers. Um, Leslie's, please continue to pray for them. Um, saw Miss Mary uh, Briggs today. Seems to be doing uh, quite well. She's uh, up and about and mobile, so uh, keep her in your prayers, though. Uh, and I'm um, sure there's many other folks we can remember, um, certainly the folks at uh, Genesis, uh, Miss Joyce and uh, uh, Ms. Edwards. Uh, keep those folks in, in our prayers as well. A couple announcements. We've got the fellowship coming up this Sunday evening after uh, after church. The, well, actually, the evening service will be held outdoors and followed by a fellowship. So um, doing okay on the sign-up? Need any? Okay. So uh, if there's anything else you think you wanted to, to ask or bring, just talk to Ms. Dola tonight, and uh, she can let you know if anything else is needed. And then meanwhile, the uh, men and boys camp out coming up on the 2nd 3rd of October. Um, you notice the weather's cooled off. It has to cool off in order for us to camp. You, know, you can't camp when it's warm. It's just rules. So anyway, <laughs> there is a sign-up sheet back there if uh, you, you want to help out on some of the, the food items uh, for that. I think that's the, the gist of it. We've got um, uh, had at least one thank you note for some buses, and I'll save that and let Pastor share that with you when he gets back. But uh, people are very grateful for the buses that have gone out already, and I know he's lining up for uh, the remaining five uh, to go out over the next uh, course of the next several weeks. So with that, um, I'm going to have, I'm sorry, another prayer request, someone, Nathan? Okay, so for those watching from uh, live stream, there will it'll only be streaming via Facebook, and you can uh, get to that through the website. And so, if you have any questions, just give us a call, and we can direct you along that line. And the reason for that is because the service will be outside, so there will not be a YouTube uh, streaming for Sunday night. Okay, anything else? All right, um, you come in and read a couple of missionary letters, and then pray for the missionaries for us, please. We have a letter here from the Reitenbach family, church planners to Greenfield, Massachusetts. And they've been talking about, of course, the whole COVID thing where they are. So some things have been canceled for them. They usually do a fair booth, the booth of their fair like we do. And that was canceled, but they went ahead and had vacation Bible school. And it says, due to the ongoing gathering restrictions, it was scaled down and less publicized event. But we still had a good turnout and a good time. The theme of the lessons was the attributes of God accumulating with the gospel message. He says, on August 23rd, I baptized Elena. What a privilege to do that. We had a period of good health through much of August, but our family seems to be dealing with the stomach virus again. Joanna dealt with it for a couple of days, and now Elena has it. Please pray that this would pass quickly and that it wouldn't make its rounds to everyone in our household. He also says that Jim, a man who attended our church from the very beginning, has passed away. He spent his last two, the last two years in and out of the hospital and nursing home and eventually had to give up his apartment and live in a nursing home full time. He joined his wife, Margie, in heaven. She passed away in 2018. He says, we have been encouraged by the new and returning visitors in church recently Please pray that our church would have an autumn season of spiritual growth and that God's hand of protection would help and help would be on us as we serve him and follow his leadership. There are several people who need God to work in their family member's life. We keep praying for those breakthroughs. In Christ, Brett Reitenbach. So there are a couple of needs there that they had. And I also want to read this letter from the Kuzels in South Africa. Um, he's going to talk here about a man named Moses who recently professed faith in Christ, and Nathan and I were able to briefly meet him it, when we went down there, so that was kind of neat to have that close experience. It says, Moses is a former student of Metropolitan International College, White River. So I'll kind of fill in the hole there. Mr. Kuzel preaches at this these colleges these high schools and so he meets a lot of young men young ladies that later go on and kind of come back to him for help and spiritual assistance and advice so th this is a, one of those guys Moses faithfully attended Bible studies while at Metro but unfortunately when he graduated in the year 2015 he left school a lost man 
This greatly concerned me. After Moses returned to his home at Bookbush, Book, Buck Ridge, about a one and a half hour drive, we continued to communicate on WhatsApp through the years. Whenever possible, I'd meet with Moses and Nelspruit to take the opportunity to preach once again the gospel of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Though many times it would appear that the truth was not being effective in his heart, God's word is forever powerful and it never returns void. Something of a spiritual nature will be accomplished, and of course we always desire that the finished work will be the salvation of the hearer, and so it happened with Moses. On September 6, 2020, at 3.17 a.m., I received an audio from Moses sharing with me his salvation testimony. Just minutes before he contacted me in that early hour, Moses repented of Moses the sinner, and he believed the gospel, calling upon the name of the Lord. It says, last Sunday, Moses returned to Nelsprite in order to publicly share his salvation testimony before the Kabakwini Bible Baptist Church. Now we have five young men saved from Bookbuck Ridge, Bushbuck Ridge, where we're planting our next church. Please do pray for this large and highly populated municipality. Respectfully and for his glory, Brother Scott Kuzel and family. So let's just take these to the, pra- to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, I thank you for those laborers in the harvest, though they be in Massachusetts or in South Africa or wherever they are. I thank you that you've put them there and that you are working through your word in those places as they're faithfully sharing it. We thankful, thank, are thankful for the Reitenbach family and do lift up um, just the family of Jim, the man who passed away, and do pray that you would give comfort there to the ones remaining and direction as they work through so many issues regarding that. I pray that the church would be able to uh, recover from that loss as well of losing a member and a faithful man of God. And I thank you for the baptism they had. I pray that you would work in the people he mentions that wanting to see you work in their lives and some breakthroughs and some surrenders to you and so forth. And I pray that that would be the case and that you would grow your church there and work mightily through by your spirit in the hearts of the lost there, bringing the salvation. And I'll ask as well, Father, for Moses. I praise you that he trusted in your son, and we rejoice in that, and we're so glad. <clears throat> and I just pray for him that he'd grow in his faith, he'd be bold. And I pray for the Kuzels that you continue to give them great boldness and an open door in those schools to continue to preach the gospel and that it'd be you would just keep that door open for them there and we praise you for what you're doing we do lift up the other missionaries as well father not by name all of them but we care about them we love them and pray that you would show yourself strong where they are and strengthen their hands and their labors encourage their hearts and fill them with your spirit as they yield to you and trust you for results I pray you'd give open doors that no man could shut where they are to preach the gospel and you'd add to your churches. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Joe, if you would lead us in prayer for some of the folks we had mentioned earlier. And uh, just to also remember just neighbors. You know, we've over time we mentioned a lot of different neighbors, um, pastors' neighbors, our neighbors, and other people's neighbors. Just to be lifting them up that God would open up doors of opportunity for us to reach them. All thank you for such a beautiful day. And God, it, uh, unbelievable weather. And we God, uh, we're here tonight with uh, hurt hearts, got some burdens that we need to give to you. Father, we thank you, Brother Glenn, tonight. Uh, the virus apparently is over with for him, but God, uh, the body has just uh, only gotten so weak that now he just doesn't want to go. And God, now they lead him to another hospital. I pray tonight, uh, God, that you'll just put your healing hand on him. Oftentimes we do pray that you'll do things such as that, that you make all things good, and everybody be happy, and God, you bring through people, or bring people through things, and God, just times it doesn't happen. And God, we're still going to pray that you'll just put your healing hand on his body. And God, uh, give the wisdom to those doctors that they'll need, that they'll be getting through this sickness. God, that uh, you brought him through the coronavirus, and thank you for that. And God, you showed yourself there. And I pray, God, you continue to do that. I 
pray for his wife, Lord, and give her strength. Lord, I'm not sure how close that is to her. Uh, he lives in Wyoming, now he's in uh, Colorado. Uh, I know that's got to be a burden in a, different, a lot of different ways for the family. I pray God you'll be with them every step they take. God, give them strength. So I pray for the Leslie's tonight, God, and all that they're going through. And God, thank you. <laughs> Sunday that Miss Leslie is doing better. I thank you for that. And God, I pray that you'll just um, just keep doing the great work in their life. Uh, God, just give them uh, what they need in, in their hearts tonight, God, to have a peace. And Lord, uh, I pray that God, as soon as they could maybe be able to come out of the house and be able to come back to church, be able to fellowship here with us. And God, um, just enjoy the house of God. Uh, Brother uh, Miss Cleb's uh, sister, Pastor mentioned that she's, or Brother Weaver mentioned that she's having surgery. Uh, the diver take a life. And I pray tonight that uh, she'll come through that well. And God, she'll be fixed and corrected, and God, she'll be able to heal up soon. God, that's a lot going on in a, within a family at one time. And God, trying to be at two places at one time doesn't work. But I just pray, God, that there'll be family there that can go both ways. And God, that uh, they, they'll, they'll both know Brother Cleb and sister both know that they're not alone. And God, someone here on earth will be there with them, Father. Here's the pastor, Miss Judy, God. God, thank you, God, and the uh, member uh, at Colorado State. And God, I know they've got, got a lot of things on their plate as well. And God, they've done well and they've held up. <coughs> this week is going to be a trying time. Uh, a lot of memories brought back. And, and then God, a lot of uh, on their uh, agenda to do. Get prepared for things to work out for them, get things settled there, God, and God, that they'll come back ready and refreshed for the Saturday, Friday, and God, uh, Sunday will be a great day here at our church, and uh, have our uh, fellowship, and God, that uh, others will be able to come, we'll have it outside, it'll be good weather, and God, it'll be an enjoyable time. God, there's many others we can think of tonight, I think of Miss Polly, Lord, and God, I believe she's maybe healed up with her hand. home, Miss Edwards, Miss Carolyn's uh, kind of confined where she's at, God, not allowed to come out because they're afraid of someone to come in. And God, just pray for these people tonight, God, that you'll just uh, be there for them. God, uh, help somebody put a smile on their face, and, and God, they can have some company of some sort, and God, just take care of them where they're at. Take a few with tonight, God, I, he's doing well, but he's got bad days as, as well. I just pray God you'll just continue to uh, allow him to just go and function as he as he pleases. And God, give him a, 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 just enjoy him, his life, Lord, I pray. And God, there's, there's a bunch of others, I'm sure. Miss Gladys um, Evans uh, was supposed to have surgery on both her hands. And God, uh, that could be a, 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 a hard time to be able to do that even right now. I don't know if it got canceled. But God, to have both hands operated on, that's a, those things be difficult for her. I pray God she'll just get things to work in her life. God, she'll look at her car. And God, maybe provide for one she could afford. And just be able to, to have God. And if you don't depend on others. Um, God, just, I'm sure there's others that are missing. But God, you know who they are tonight. Within our church family, even without. And Brother Weaver said, pray for our, our, our neighbors. Pray God we're a testimony to our neighbors. And sometimes that may be difficult to do. Uh, they may look at us in different ways and, 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 and see things that may not, to them, be justifiable. But God, help us uh, to be the testimony and witness we can be uh, to our co-workers, to our neighbors, to our family, to friends. And God, that the others will see you shine through us and we can be the witness and testimony we ought to be. Bless tonight, God, and everything we do. Pray for Brother Weaver to bring some message. Prepare us for even now before the word of God is even brought before us. Pray for Pastor as he preaches tonight. God, uh, just uh, let the house of God be full there with people yearning to hear from the Word of God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. James? James? Clothing swap. One more announcement. Uh, we do intend to have the clothing swap Friday and Saturday, uh, starting at 8 in the morning. Uh, some will be here well before that to take stuff out the intention is still to have it outside so pray about the weather 
that it will be clear and we can do all that out, outdoors. It'll be much easier to handle if we can do that outdoors. So please come along, ask, invite neighbors. We need people to come and take things. We don't really need any more. <laughs> There's plenty of stuff, but they're still free to bring stuff that they wish. Go ahead, let's sing the next song at Calvary, 67. <laughs> seated. If you'll open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, please. That will be our text for tonight. Matthew chapter 6. I'll have a little bit of a story that will be interwoven. It's not a long story, but it'll make a few points as we go through. Long years ago, when I got my first automobile, I was able to buy a Galaxy, Ford Galaxy 500, and most people don't have a clue what that is, and I didn't before I bought it either, but nevertheless, it was my first car, and I was very happy to get it, and of course, it was not a new car, and so on the way home, it ran out of gas, and uh, so I was a little surprised, though, because the gas gauge said I had a quarter tank, a little surprised, had to deal with all that, and um, they had two very significant problems that caused it to run out of gas. And during this message tonight, we're going to look at those two key things and try to make some parallels or use that story to explain a few points as we move forward. For now, let's go ahead and take a look at the key text, which is verse 33. Very common verse. Common meaning you hear it a lot. Many of you probably have it memorized. Many children memorize it very early on. I'm just not sure if we've all conquered living it, which is probably what we can say about most every verse in the scriptures. But we're going to take a look at it tonight and see if we can't get some motivation once again to try to strive to live out this verse that Jesus obviously thought was important, as he put it as part of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6 reads, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we are very familiar with that text, and 
we believe it's true. We, we say we believe everything in the scripture is true. Lord, we desire to, to live out our lives so that other people watching us would know that we believe it's true. Lord, tonight, in these next few minutes, we're just asking that you would open up uh, this verse, this sermon that you gave as you stood at the base of the mountain there on the, the mountainside and you spoke to the, that multitude. Lord, would you just open our eyes? Lord, perhaps that we could even understand as those people understood, maybe even more because we have a lot more scripture to go with it. Father, would you just open up our hearts and minds so that we would understand what your Holy Spirit wants to teach us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was reading through this recently, I saw verse 33 as a very pivotal, pivotal verse throughout this whole Sermon on the Mount. I guess we could just read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That was Jesus' sermon. Don't know if he said more at this particular time or not, but that's what was recorded for us. It doesn't take really that long, so it's not a real long sermon. However, throughout the ages, I'm confident there have been thousands upon thousands of messages that have been spawned just from these various verses. I know in our homeschooling program that we used, we went through this whole Sermon on the Mount, verse by verse, sometimes a couple verses at a time, and just use that as a launching point to teach many different topics uh, to our, our kids and to our whole family. So it's, it's a very, very rich uh, text. I'm not, I will not attempt to go through and uh, expound upon the entire passage, but what I want to do is take a look at the Sermon on the Mount and kind of skim across it fairly quickly, emphasizing a few points here and there, but using this verse as the pivotal verse. So just keep in your mind, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So as you, if you flip back through and kind of follow along in your, in your Bible as we go through it, it starts in chapter 5, and that first section, as we know, is often referred to as the Beatitudes. Many of the verses, verse 3 through 11, all start with blessed, blessed. All right, that's meaning they are blessed, they're receiving some benefit, as well as it's often also seen as happy. Um, and so w those are verses that we're very familiar with. If you look at verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, that has a reference as we look back at verse 33 of 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Well, perhaps being poor in spirit is one way we can do that. It shouldn't surprise us that we, if God gives us something over here in verse 33 and tells us something we ought to be doing, that perhaps in the rest of his message, it, didn't, it doesn't correlate. You know, he didn't already give us some ideas and some uh, methods or some uh, practical examples of how we can live out the verse that he's going to tell us to live out later. So he builds upon it. So as we go through 5, he's building, teaching us how to seek ye first the kingdom of God. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if, they, if you are, are learning to be poor in spirit, then that is one way to be focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Poor in spirit. It's not necessarily poor as in a poverty type scenario, but in our spirit, we're not, it's not a boastful, proud spirit. It's a, it's a very humble spirit. It's a totally, total dependence upon the Lord to give us what we need recognizing that our very spirit is hinged upon the Holy Spirit of God. So, poor in spirit, you know, we are very humble uh, before the, our Lord. We, we understand our place before an almighty God. Verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It says that we're supposed to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So here's a picture of those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, and it gives us that confidence that if we do hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be filled. For those who hunger and thirst after food, they typically will go after it until they obtain it. Now, we recognize some go hungry for various reasons, and might I say some believers go hungry for the rich word of God, for the, for the food that they get from the word of God, because they don't know how to eat properly, or they refuse 
open, dare I say, the refrigerator. I mean, can you imagine your kitchen full, your refrigerator full of food, and you're starving to death? Why? Because you just won't go open the door and pull it out. That's a very simple example here, but is that not the same thing spiritually? So often our Bibles just kind of sit here on the shelf while we bring it to church, and we'll follow along a little bit in the sermon, but we don't, we don't feast on it. We, we don't dive in and, and eat it, you know, uh, eat up his words as our daily food. And, and so, therefore, we can go hungry, and we're, we're spiritually starving to death because we won't eat the food that's right in front of us. Blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Righteousness. People use that word. Um, you know, they'll even, it may not always be in the proper context, but people understand the very root of that is right. You know, when you seek after righteousness, you're seeking after things that are right in the eyes of God. And you want to be in the right standing with God. So you're pursuing after those things in life. Dropping down to verse 10, per, um, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, we get another picture of those who are going to understand and obtain that, that kingdom. But in this case, it's also referencing the righteousness. And so now here's a picture of those who do pursue after righteousness. They have hunger and thirsted after righteousness and, and are filled, but now they're going to be persecuted for it. Jesus makes no attempt to tell us that this life is easy. He, quite the contrary. He actually tells us and says, you will be persecuted. You know, if, you, if you're going to pursue after me, you will be persecuted. And he says, if they're going to persecute me, they're going to persecute you too. We often get lazy in America, in our churches, because we're not persecuted. You've all heard the stories, very real, true stories. Even today, not just in the past, but even today, go around the world. Some of our missionaries are in those places right now. They will get persecuted. Some people, very physical persecution, some psychological, some legal. There's various different ways, but there are people today around the world, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are being persecuted for righteousness' sake. And Jesus said long ago, blessed are those. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So this verse about seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness doesn't come without a price. Now there's rich rewards, but it doesn't come without a price to pay right now. And it's not that we are paying some great price. All we're doing is living it out do, based on the price that Jesus already paid. We don't even have to do it on our own strength. The scriptures are very clear that our strength comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, certainly a picture of a man that I, I can't imagine that anyone has suffered more than that man did when he walked the earth. You know, there's a whole section of scripture that walks through all the different things he, he endured. Uh, and left for dead after being stoned. The man suffered physically. And when he prayed to ask something, this thorn in the flesh, to be removed from him, Jesus just said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Jesus knows it's not easy. I think, unfortunately, we live in a day and age, in America anyway, that for many of us, it's easy. And so maybe we don't even understand what it really means to be the, the followers of Jesus that, that these people knew and many people around the world. So let's continue to keep that in mind as we're, we're talking about this pursuit after, after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not something just simple that says, okay, I'm going to read my Bible every day. Great, absolutely, read your Bible every day. But don't think that's the end. Don't think that checks the box and says, yep, I'm pursuing after God. Well, that's a good beginning. It's a great place to start. You know, open the fridge. But that, that's not the end. You've got to keep pressing on beyond that. So verse 11 and, and 12 talks about there are rewards in heaven for those who are persecuted. In, in, chap, in verse 16 of chapter 5, it tells us that our, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So there's a purpose in this. Why are we pursuing after the kingdom and after his righteousness? So that our Father will be glorified. Not that anybody will be looking at us, but that anyone who does see us 
because the way we live it out, because we're living through the, the power and the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ, all they see is our Father. And so they glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, so he shall be called he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So now it goes beyond just hearing the word. It goes beyond just understanding the word. They're saying if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, then not only do you have to obey them, but teach others to obey them too. And you say, well, but I'm not a teacher. Are you sure? Are you sure? All teachers don't have titles. All teachers don't get to stand in a podium in front of a classroom. If you have children, you're a teacher. <laughs> if you have grandchildren, you're a teacher. If you interact with other kids and other people, you are a teacher. You may not be a very good teacher, or you may be a great teacher. But let's face it, we are passing on what we know or what we don't know. We're passing on our, what we believe about our walks with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when people look at us, once they know that we're a believer, the tag's on you. Because now they're saying, oh, so now they're going to watch. You know, how many times have you come across someone that, well, yeah, I grew up in church. Well, what are you doing now? Well, you know, uh, you're either hurt or, oh, those hypocrites. Or, you know, they saw other people didn't do it right. And so they, people watch. And if we don't live out the life uh, by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, then people are getting the wrong message. And so we're not being blessed in, in heaven because we're not doing and teaching uh, the commandments of God. In verse 20, it says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So without righteousness, forget heaven. You're not going. Now, fortunately, righteousness is not about what we do. That is how people see it, but righteousness is about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn over in Romans that the righteousness was imputed to Abraham because of his faith. So when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved, not because of anything that we can do or did, but because simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and that faith now is imputed unto us as righteousness, just as if we were standing in the presence of God, righteous as he looks down and sees the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us. It's taught over and over here, and, and it's, it's so easily, we miss that so easily, I think, when we constantly try to put something else there. I just got to do something else. No, we got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now that faith is imputed unto us as righteousness. So in verse 20, it says, we focus on righteousness, and that's, that's all, we, we need that righteousness. We got to be saved. In, in 20 and 21, I'm not going to read all these verses, but now we're talking about some things that are going to appear in our lives, either through avoiding things or doing things that are all part of that seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All right. So living right for those who live right. Looking at verse 21 and 22, no anger. We're not going to be angry. And it says thou shalt not kill. Uh, you've heard that it's not that it was said of them by, by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so Jesus starts relating anger to murder, and then he relates lust to adultery. Um, and so he's giving us these examples of things that were, were supposed to be uh, reconciled to other people. It's not okay to, to be unreconciled. It's not okay to continue along in known offenses. We're supposed to deal with those. We get a lot of scripture that teaches us how to deal properly when we have been the offender or if we've been offended. And there's scriptures to handle both of those. And Jesus says we're supposed to deal with those. Even to the point that being reconciled was more important than giving a gift at the altar. He says, get up and go deal with that. Then you can come back and give your gifts at the altar. Let's, let's deal with these relationship issues. Um, be reconciled. So and then we're supposed to honor marriage. He deals with no lusting, no adultery, no divorce. And so he puts marriage in the perspective that it's supposed to be. Why? Because as we learn later on, marriage is a picture of Jesus and his church. Well, obviously he wants us to live out marriage properly so that we're properly representing the, what, um, what the Lord Jesus Christ said that his relationship is with the church. Uh, keeping our oaths, jumping down to verse 33 through 37. We're, we're supposed to keep our oath. 
Let your yea be yea and your nay nay. Our speech should honor the Lord Jesus Christ. When we speak, people should absolutely, I mean, people should just say, hey, if he said it, it's true. Or if he or she said they would be here, they're going to be here. You know, short of some, you know, totally out of their control. You know, our, we should be trustworthy. People should know that when we say, give our word on something, that, that they can count on that. And so God is saying that's what righteousness looks like. It's people who keep their word and speak truth. Hard, okay, here's some hard ones. Uh, 538 through 48, the whole, this whole section here, loving our enemies. That's challenging. When's the last time, whether you're watching TV, watching a computer, watching, listening to the news, when is the last time that you saw a picture of someone loving their enemies? That's not what you see out there on the news. The world knows that. You don't love your enemies. You hate your enemies. You try to destroy your enemies. You wish evil things against your enemies. That's what the world says. That's what our flesh says, does it not? I mean, how, how often do you just sit around going, wow, how can, I, how can I bless my enemies? That's not natural. That's very supernatural. Well, can we live supernaturally? If we have the very God of the universe with his Holy Spirit dwelling in us, then yes, we can. And so he teaches us that those who are pursuing after righteousness, those who are seeking first the kingdom of God, are people who go far out of the way. They don't curse their enemies. They bless their enemies. They seek good for their enemies. They pray for their enemies. Now, we're not saying we want our enemies to prosper in their evil doing, but wouldn't it be awesome to see your enemy repent and be saved? And turn to the living God. Now, there's some enemies that I, you know, I'm telling you, you don't, it's like, oh, I don't even know if I can pray for them because I, I just hate them. They've hurt me. They've, you know, whatever. You know, they're, they're so wicked. Well, that's God's job. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Everyone will not be saved. We know that. And so, but that's God's doing, not mine. And, and so, if God wishes to save the wicked, who am I to, to say otherwise? He saved me. So if he saved me, then, then is someone else not worthy of being saved too? So loving our enemies, that's, that's what righteousness looks like. And then jump into chapter 6, it starts off, this first part is almsgiving. We're supposed to give in secret and be rewarded openly. So we're not, well, look at me, I'm, uh, look at here, look how much I'm giving. You know, no, 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 that's, that's not the way we're taught to, to live, the way Jesus taught us here. He says, no, you give in secret. Why? It stops at pride problem. You know, it's, it's not a pride issue. So you give in secret. Let God do the rewarding. And let him reward in his time and in his way and in the way he wants to do that. So we, we give secretly and reward it openly. And then we have the next section, pray secretly, putting God and his righteousness first. And then he'll reward us openly. And then he even says, it reemphasizes in uh, verse 14 and 15, forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is very, very important. It's very hard walking through the Christian life, looking like a Christian and being bitter. You usually can see bitterness in people, especially once it starts growing. You might be able to cover it up a little bit at first, you know, if you learn how to put the face on. But in time, it becomes very, very obvious when you're bitter. It comes out in your speech. Your speech just gets harsh, especially when you're talking about the person you're bitter against or the thing that you're bitter against. Um, your, your whole complexion can change when you're bitter. Your health deteriorates when you're bitter. And it's been shown over and over. And go through the Proverbs, too. It, it'll show you the same thing. And so it's not new, but even in modern science, they'll, they'll, if you go read about it, they'll show you how bitterness literally destroys your body. And so bitterness must be dealt with. When we pursue after righteousness, we say bitterness is going to stop me from serving the Lord the way it's supposed to, the way I'm supposed to be serving. It's going to stop me from having a heart to reach out to people, because bitterness just pulls you up inside yourself, and you can't, you can't be open to serve other people, and so bitterness must be dealt with. That's a whole other message, but the Bible has a lot to say about that, and there you can overcome bitterness. So if you have 
a challenge with that, then by all means, come, talk to pastor, uh, talk to us, and we, we can help you talk through that scripturally, how you deal with that. Because I'm not saying it's easy. Remember what we said at the very beginning? Living righteously, pursuing, putting uh, the kingdom of God, seeking first the kingdom, is not easy. None of these things are easy. But boy, when we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, later on in First John it says that his commandments are not grievous challenging verse so we pray secretly rewarded openly and then 16 through 18 we fast secretly and rewarded openly and jumping down to 19 uh, chapter 6 verse 19 through 21 lay up lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It may not be a super example, but remember my car that ran out of gas? The, one of the reasons, well, the reason it ran out of gas was because there was a hole in the tank. It's very hard to keep gasoline inside the tank when you have a hole that lets it out. And so it had, didn't have much in there, and so I was driving along, and it ran out of gas on the way home. So to get it home, we had to get some gas. Well, that's like storing up riches on earth in bags with holes in them. And that's the picture when we try to store up riches on earth. The things that we find so valuable, and you name it. I mean, anything of that, that we put great value on. I mean, it can be cars and lands and money and homes and clothes and jewelry. And, I mean, just, you know, the list goes on and on the things that are valuable to us that consume our resources. It's not that we don't do what we have to do to live, okay? That's not the point. The point is, when we pursue after things and they have our heart, it says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There's a difference between providing for our necessities and storing up treasures on earth. And storing up treasures on earth is like putting money in a bag with a hole in it. Yeah, have you ever been... Eh, you see it more often with a little boy, not necessarily, but they drop a coin in their pocket and it hits the floor because they got that hole in the pocket. Why? Because they put everything in that pocket and it just wears a hole in it after a while. It happens to others too. But uh, So holes in your pocket, you can't keep the money in. Bags, storing up treasures on earth in, in bags that uh, with holes in them won't hold. Just like my car would not hold that gas with that hole in the tank. It just doesn't work. So we lay up treasures in heaven. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? Well, we invest in the things that are going to last forever. I've heard it many times, and maybe it could be said in different ways, but the souls of men and God's word, those are two things that are definitely going to last forever. You know, the scriptures teach us that. And so if we invest in the souls of men and in the, the word of God, then we are laying up treasures in heaven. If you invest in people, the souls of men and women, and they get saved, then they will be in heaven forever with us. That's a significant investment. You know, there's a lot of people who will give you advice on finances, but there is nobody out there that can show you how to invest in money that's going to last forever. It can't be done. The only things that last forever are the things that are going to make it to heaven. Because everything else is going to be passed away. It's going to burn up. It's not going to last. So let's invest in things that are going to last forever. Winning souls to, for Christ, discipling them so they serve and are also winning others. Because just like a physical investment that multiplies itself over time, wow, the investment in souls absolutely multiplies itself. Because if you win one soul to Christ, and then they win another soul to Christ, and, oh, by the way, God grants you the opportunity to win two, ten however many people, what well, each of those start going out and winning multiple people to Christ, then that multiplies very rapidly. And God loves multiplication. He, he really loves multiplication in that manner. So let's store, store up treasures in heaven. And in that same section, section, it says in verse 24 that no man can serve two masters, for he's going to hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't Seek ye first the kingdom of God and something else. It would defy the very words. It wouldn't be first anymore. 
you know, if we're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, then everything else has got to be second, third, fourth, right? So th- here's another place where he's just, he's spelling it out. He's, gonna co- he's getting closer to his verse here, and he's giving us more and more data, if you will, to, so we understand this point when he gives it to us, but you can't serve two masters. It doesn't work. I've been in jobs before where in the wisdom of the, the government, they set up structures so that literally I had two bosses. There was one point where I actually had three bosses, and each one of them were all evaluating my performance, and each one of them wanted to know what I was doing all the time, and they were all very leery about what I was doing for the other ones. Now, why it was set up that way is a long story, but um, even when I was there, I drew little pictures about what it looked like for three, and, and every time I looked at it, I'm going, you cannot serve two masters. There's always you make it work, you get through your job, you do what you got to do, but there was built-in conflict, the very nature of it. You can't serve two masters, which is also, by the way, why parents have to be in unity, because you can't serve two masters, so give your kids a break. Um, so don't, so God, oh, and the, the reason we don't serve mammon, or, or, okay, I'm sorry, let me slow down here. As we press on past that verse, as we get into verse 25, down all the way to 32, he gives this picture here. Of, he starts in 25, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? The fowls of the air, um, they don't reap, and yet they uh, are gathered into barns, but the Heavenly Father feeds them. The lilies of the field, they don't spin and toil, and yet the, the Lord blesses them and, and clothes them. And it even says that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And so God knows how to take care of what's his. We cannot possibly take care of things as good as God can. I mean, think about it. He is the creator of all the universe. Nothing was, and he created it. He has the wealth untold available to him. He can do anything. And he has. Throughout history, the stories are I mean, limitless. We have tons of them in the scriptures, and many of you have personal examples of what, how God has provided for you in, in times when you thought, there's no way, there's not enough. And yet, amazingly, God makes it work. And because, so he's limitless. So when we serve him first, now it frees him up to bless us and provide for us. But why, I mean, think about this. This is just a logical comment. Why would he go out of his way to provide for a person that is trying to do it all themselves. He wants the glory. He, he already told us many times throughout Scripture, he's the one to get the glory, not us. And so if we're down here getting all the glory, I mean, you just kind of see, it's kind of like when you're trying to help a child. You know, they get to this stage where I can do it myself. You know, it happens at different stages and different multiple times, actually, and through life. But there's just it comes a point where you're trying to help the child. I-, I can do it myself. Oh, so you step back, and you let them do it themselves. Sometimes they actually can, and it's part of that growth process. And you go, wow, and you get to praise them, and then they continue on. Sometimes they just have to get to the end of their uh, newfound abilities and realize, oh, maybe I can't do it myself. Maybe I need some help. And I think that's the way we often are with our Lord and that we're busy, busy, busy trying to get it done ourselves, trying to solve our problems, and I can just picture God just looking down going, when are you going to stop? When are you going to stop? Oh, could you just, uh, no, okay, I'll wait. And he's such a patient God. He's amazingly patient with us. But then at some point, we just get to the end of our rope. It's like, Lord, I need your help. He says, I know, I've been waiting right here. So I I think our Lord is just waiting to provide for us. Now, when he provides for us, he frees us. It's a very freeing thing when we get out of the way and he says, ah, great. I can clothe you like the lilies of the field. I can provide the food for you like I do for the birds. I mean, the birds, they're just going to die and go back to dust. And yet he cares for them and feeds them. The grass, I mean, it's just going to grow up, wither, and die. And yet, he clothes them in great beauty. I mean, look at the wildflowers. Wow. We didn't do that. God did that. So, now he's saying, let me free you to seek ye first the kingdom of God in his righteousness. 
And so by providing for us and being our provider, then we are free to focus on him. Our minds are no longer consumed with worry and the cares of life, and we can focus on him. Yes, there are responsibilities that he's given us. Absolutely. There are things he's told us to do. But as we go about doing those things, again, we can't do it in our own strength. Day by day, you know, I have to work. Why? Because that was the job given to Adam and Eve. The, the, there are things about work that were part of the curse, but I don't think work itself was part of the curse. Work was what God gave Adam and Eve to do. He, he gave them a job to, to care for the garden. Work is not bad. <laughs> it's not a bad word, okay? And so work is part of what we do in life. Work takes a lot of different forms, and sometimes it can be bad if we handle it wrong and we try to do it all in our own strength. But work is what God has given us to do. Sometimes the work is in the home, raising kids. Sometimes the work is out there on a ship or in a battlefield with the military and, and everything in between. You know, Brother Joe's out there in the, in the dark and the terrible weather, and yet it's his job. That's what he does. And aren't we grateful? Because the lights stay on, and even when they do go off around here, they don't stay gone off too long. You hear about other places, and the power's off for a long time, but they keep the power on, and I, that's very helpful. And so we all have our different jobs to do, but we don't do them in our own strength. We, we, we can't do this stuff in our own power, so we do it in God's strength. So then he provides our strength, he provides our resources, he provides everything for us. And then we're free to obey him, keep his commandments, pursue after righteousness, and pursue after the kingdom of God. So then he gets to verse 33. And it, and it could be a conclusion, but it's not. It, it could be a conclusion when he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Keep your right focus. Uh, keep your eyes focused. Uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, constantly looking to Jesus. When our eyes are focused on our Lord, then they're not consumed with all these things. We go, oh, Lord, I do. Oh, you do know. I know that. Okay, well, you did teach me to ask, so I'll ask. You know, so we'll obey and we'll do what we're supposed to do. But assuming all the time, not with an anxious heart, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, uh, make your requests be made known for God. And so just pray, talk to God. He knows it already, but he still tells us to pray. So let's be obedient and pray, trusting that he will provide because he has and he, and he will continue to do so. Remember that he's already preparing for all of eternity, and he's going to handle all of eternity? That's a very long time, and yet he's going to be responsible for that, and he's going to provide for that. And oh, by the way, before I came into this world, God had taken care of everything. So who, who am I to think that in my few short years that all of a sudden I can step in and, and play God? No. God's taken care of all eternity past. He's going to take care of all eternity future. I think we can trust him for today. I think he can handle today, too. There's not going to be any surprises. I find that very freeing if we can choose to believe this and, and if we can to, to work and live this verse out. It's actually a great stress reliever. So can you imagine this? Someone's really stressed, and you're going, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Wow. We exhort one another with the word of God. And so we just remind one another, oh, yes, let's keep our eyes focused on our Lord. Yep, today may be a very hard day. I mean, let's face it, we've been praying for people that are going through very hard things. It's not saying things are easy. This verse is nothing about saying things are easy. But boy, when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ to handle it, it's very doable now. Well, when we get this focused, oh, by the way, just kind of another th way to look at this, it's kind of like minding your own business. There's things that God says he'll do, and there's things that he tells us to do. And as long as we focus on the things he tells us to do, he can take care of his business. So sometimes maybe God's just saying, mind your own business. When we get this straight, chapter 7 comes along, and I'll just go through it very quickly. But the first section talks about judging wrongly. Uh, it doesn't say don't judge. It, does, it says judge properly. When we are seeking first the kingdom, then we're going to deal with that uh, beam in my or on our own eye before we start worrying about that that moat um, in that um, yeah the moat in our brother's eye 
You know, we're going to be focused on our own problems, dealing with those, getting those right before the Lord, and not be constantly focused on everybody else's problems and pointing out their errors. So let's judge properly, and we can do that if we seek first the kingdom. It's uh, learning to, 7 through 11 is learning to pray for, for needs. He tells us what our prayer should be like. We are supposed to pray, and we can trust God to be a Heavenly Father who gives us what we need. And then verse 12, putting others before ourselves. You know, it says, uh, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. So this is the law and the prophets. We can do that when we're focused on our Lord. Choosing the narrow way, knowing God's best. Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. A straight, nautically, is a narrow passage of water connecting two seas or two other large areas of water. In another context, with that same visual picture here, it's a reference to a situation characterized by a specific degree of trouble or difficulty. You ever refer to, ooh, I'm, I'm in the straight, I'm in a straight, meaning I'm, I'm between a rock and a hard place. It, it's a tough spot. Well, <laughs> God says choose the narrow way because the narrow way leads us to, to life everlasting. Um, it allows me... I'm going to skip that part. Uh, we, that could be a whole other topic in itself, so we'll skip that. But if you jump down to 15 through 20, it does remind us that there are traps along the way. As we're choosing to pursue after God first, then there are traps. There's going to be false teachers. There's going to be telling to people saying, hey, come along here, come along here. No, no, do it this way. Oh, come on, come out here on the Broadway. Um, but you're going to know them by their fruits, and so this is saying avoid that. you you got to... You can't fall victim to the sin and the things that come along the way. You know, in Pilgrim's Proce Progress, it has the picture of Vanity Fair. And that's when it's almost like going to the carnival, and you know, all the vendors are saying, come over here, come over here, you can get this, buy this, get this. You know, that's kind of that picture of life, is that everything's calling for us. Wait a minute. Listen to the still small voice. Ah, only that one. Wait a minute, but that's that, look at that narrow way. Yeah, that's fine for me. I'll take that narrow one. I'll take the straight gate. That's how we, we have to live when we're pursuing after the Lord first. Verse 21 through 23, uh, just make a point here. This is not about lip service. These are people who are coming to the Lord in the end. This is not everyone that saith to, unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He never knew them. So here they are. They are measuring themselves by certain gauges. And these gauges, in this case, look like, hey, I was prophesying, I was casting out devils, and I've done many wonderful works. They were gauging themselves by the things that they were doing. And they were saying, we look like Christians, don't we? Aren't we doing the right things? Their gauge said, looking great. The gauge on my car, when it ran out of gas, it said I had a quarter of a tank of gas left. Why should I be thinking I'm running out of gas? I got a quarter of a tank. I only had to go three miles. I was looking at a bad gauge. Come to find out, the gauge didn't work below a quarter tank. The quarter was empty. I didn't know that. These people are, are using a gauge that's wrong. It's broken. We gauge ourselves with a bad gauge on a regular basis. We set ourselves up thinking that we're accomplishing something great, when in reality, God says, filthy rags. Worthless. But God, look, we're doing wonderful things. We even cast out devils. Worthless. So instead, he gives them the answer in following the following verses. He says, let me, let me tell you what the real gauge is. <laughs> Step one, you've got to have the right foundation. If you don't have the right foundation, don't build your house. If you don't have the right gauges, don't bother using them because you're going to be steered wrong. Aviators know all about gauges. <laughs> and the, the, the mantra for an aviator, for a pilots are, Trust your gauges. Trust your gauges. I'm in the middle of a thick cloud. I can't see anything. Trust your gauges. They have to believe in their gauges. If their gauges fail, they fail. God says, 
Let's use the proper gauge. First, you got to be founded on a rock. Who is our rock? Our rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the number one thing. Um, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. We have to be looking at the right thing. Our life must be founded on the rock. How is that founded? The foundation begins when we are saved. When God points out the error of our ways, our sin, our failure to be able to live up to the law of God, just how despicable and worthless anything that we have to offer is, and we go, but God, what am I supposed to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In thy house. We start there. We must have the foundation on our Lord Jesus Christ. We must be saved. If you're not starting there, the rest of this is, is meaningless. You, you can't possibly live the Sermon on the Mount without the Lord Jesus Christ as the foundation. So we have to start there. Uh, we, we have to... Uh, once told Thomas, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way. So you want the kingdom? You want righteousness? You want, um, it's, God is not a God who puts this carrot out in front of us that's impossible to reach. I mean, that's that picture of, you know, leading a horse along, but you don't let him have it because you want to keep him going. God's not like that. He doesn't put this carrot, he doesn't say, oh, here's the kingdom of God, but you can't have it. You'll never reach it. It's impossible. That's not the God we serve. No, he is the God. Not only does he, he tell us that heaven is our, our eternal destiny, he tells us everything we have to do to get there. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we're supposed to do and teach his commandments. He, he gives a number of commandments throughout the scriptures. Do these things. Spend time in my word. Delight greatly in my commandments. You know, um, uh, don't let these, th th this law depart from thy mouth, but, o but do, uh, observe it and do it and live it out. I, I've heard recently someone mention that grace was the fuel that makes a car go. You know, it's great to have a car, but if you've got no fuel, it doesn't move. My car would not go forward anymore. <coughs> it was done. So it needed grace. <laughs> it needed fuel. God gives the grace. He not only gives the means to get places, he, he tells us how to get it, he tells us where we're going, and then he gives us all the grace we need. Grace is a whole other topic, and grace is a big topic, but one of the per pictures of that is what God gives us to make his commandments doable, and so that we can say later on that his commandments are not grievous. Why? Because we have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to give us all that we need to do, the power to do, not just what um, we want to do, but what we ought to do. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. One, you've got to build upon the rock of Jesus. Two, you've got to seek him in sincerity and truth. You've got to let God be the provider. You've got to focus on what's right, pursuing after righteousness. Don't be distracted by the world along the way. Just delight greatly in his commandments. Start here, and let's seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray.